When it comes to loving things, like really loving things, a lot of times the reasons you love them, not everyone can appreciate. For example, my wife thinks I look handsome first thing in the morning. Retro games are similar. There are certain reasons we love them that not everyone appreciates. Naturally, not Everything that retro gamers love is 100% exclusive to us, but if you're not a retro gamer and some of the things I cover in this video sound good to you, maybe it's time to become a retro gamer. Quick little test for you. With a series of sights and sounds, tell me what you think of this. Part of the retro gaming experience for many is plugging big clunky cartridges into our favorite console or consoles of choice. Notice I said big, tiny little Switch cartridges aren't quite the same, although don't get me wrong, in a pinch they can still do the job. Everybody just listen. Shh, 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 shh. Oh yeah, still pretty good, but still hard to beat those bigger old cartridges, providing a substantial tactile feel to starting up a game, and don't even get me started on power switches. I recently made it a priority to be more efficient with my time, so while staring at my games late one night, I thought, what am I doing? I could be plugging these cartridges into consoles while I stare at them. Now that's what I call efficiency and a night well spent. Cartridge-based games also have little to no loading, at least if we're talking about the older cartridges that tend to hang around us retro gamers. Plus, there's just a unique charm that cartridges have. Each type of cartridge for each system differs from the last one. They often have the game's artwork built in, and while Switch cartridges are still cool, in my opinion, they're not as unique as most older cartridges because they kind of just feel like SD cards, and I can even lick SD cards without a bad taste. Next to thing retro gamers love, secrets. And no, I'm not confusing retro gamers with gossipy high school kids. With older games, secrets were a big thing, whether it be things hidden within the game or unlockables you could earn by accomplishing various feats within the game. And right away, people who play newer games might be thinking, whoa, whoa, there's secrets and hidden stuff in newer games too, which in some cases maybe there are, but in a way, nothing is a secret with the internet anymore. The secret to your grandmammy's famous apple pie, nutmeg, and cardamom. Grandma, you dirty dog. But yeah, for games nowadays, the secrets aren't really secrets, unless you're really disciplined in avoiding looking things up online to make it more like how it used to be back in the day. Which, I'm telling you, unless you lived how things were back then, it's kind of hard to understand. Information could be had from magazines, more on those later, but a lot of speculation just came from word of mouth. As a result, when you discovered something secret or unlockable in a game back then, it was not only exciting because it was probably something cool, but it was potentially also exciting because it meant it was real, not one of the many, and I mean many, rumors floating around that were totally false. And aiding the confusion was the fact that some things that sounded fake were actually real. Figuring it all out was tricky. Playing as the Beastie Boys in NBA Jam, but not Michael Jordan. Getting Ryu's Fireball from Street Fighter and Mega Man X. Did Ricky give Chelsea cooties during recess? What are cooties? Loosely connected to this was cheat codes, whether it be with cheat devices like GameShark or cheats you could unlock within the games themselves. Gold and I always had some of my favorites, making it fun to replay some of the stages you'd already beaten, but in ways that encourage horsing around. Because older video games would often be difficult, there was a certain novelty in being able to mess with the rules a little bit, whether it was in ways that made the game easier or not. Nowadays, I suppose the equivalent would be modding, but there 
there's a different feel to the culture of cheat codes from back then. The specific use of the word cheat is very telling, right in line with the edginess of the 90s that often promoted it, especially in the video game world. The word cheat being marketed as a cool thing in games was basically embracing being a dirty dog. Next thing retro gamers love, paper. Specifically paper game manuals, magazines, and walkthrough guides. Stuff we used to get that was fun that we no longer have. Add it to the list. As far as getting the information that was contained within these various paper items, there are certainly alternative ways of still getting it all nowadays, mostly online, but the way I think of it is that when it comes to getting video game stuff, for more people, the more stuff the better. And this was more stuff to get. Many of us used to even read a game's manual with excitement and anticipation like you wouldn't believe during the drive home from the store. The experience right after purchasing a game sure has changed with online shopping. I find myself still using some of the official player's guides for certain games, because I just find it to be a lot more enjoyable than looking stuff up on my phone. Provides a much more palpable, I'm doing something type of feel to the experience. Won't catch me using paper maps for navigation though, I prefer MapQuest. Next thing that retro gamers love is something that I'm only going to mention briefly because I've already done a bunch of videos about them, and that would be CRT TVs, which simply have to be mentioned. Sometimes it seems like if it weren't for retro gamers and people with a all step using it when it doesn't work mindset, there wouldn't even be any CRT TVs left. Without a doubt, Retro gamers are helping to keep CRT TVs alive by giving them a home, which is good news for retro gamers, because we're the only ones who'd miss them if they were gone. Next up, we've got games that are shorter. Not like that. Shorter as in take less time to play through. Because most retro gamers are older people, despite my efforts to welcome the younger generations and seriously join the hobby, the games are great. But because most most retro gamers are older, that means they are also people with less free time. We've got stuff to do. Work, chores, responsibilities, and these games won't just stare at themselves. Actually, I might be onto something here. Shorter games just fit better into our limited slash non-existent free time a lot better. And hey, if you really want a time saver, just imagining you played games works pretty well too. But when we see longer games, sometimes all we can do is hide. The idea of a longer game can be more daunting than it is exciting, which is a bummer, but that's just the reality for a lot of us. Especially since most retro gamers own more than one console, with the idea of retro gaming often being to go back and experience all the older games we either missed or remember fondly. So there's often a lot of games catching our attention, making shorter games the opposite of a bad thing, but instead a good thing. It's like they always say, the sooner something enjoyable ends, the better. Wait, that's not right. Right? Let's try again. The sooner something enjoyable ends, the sooner you can stop feeling guilty for spending time enjoying it. Still not quite right. A penny saved is a penny earned. Now we're really off the mark. How about games don't need to be long to be enjoyable and shorter games allow us to play more games overall. Right in line with shorter games and the spirit of approachability, we have controllers with less buttons on them. We certainly don't need our games to require a lot of buttons, with just a handful of buttons often being enough to provide a robust set of controls for the type of games we enjoy. Especially when it comes to 2D games, something that has happily remained acceptable with most gamers from any generation, a controller with limited buttons is often pretty ideal especially when it comes to some of the excellent D-pads you'll find on older controllers, with D-pads being a great way to play 2D games. And while we're talking about 2D games with simple controls, I'd like to bring up the last thing that I feel retro gamers love more than most, and that would be wacky mascot characters, which 
certainly would make their way into the 3D space with more complex controls as well, but they originally came from the 2D space, with Sonic showing that there could be more than just Mario as a popular mascot everybody tried to create their own. I've always had a soft spot for Sparks during Rocket Knight Adventures myself, a possum with a sword and a rocket pack. On the opposite side, my least favorite mascot would be a different possum that's not as awesome, the ironically named Awesome Possum. In any case, these mascot characters were a lot of fun, not only because of the various designs they'd have, but also how they would affect the types of games they were in, making for some interesting gameplay mechanics that would utilize each character's unique abilities. I really wish we still got more characters like these today than we do. But that's what retro gaming is for, a way to love the things we love. All that said, I would of course be curious what you, as a retro gamer, would say you love about retro games that you feel is particular to the hobby. There are a lot of different things you could say, of which I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Oh, and for those of you who might say, what about renting games? Well, the case could be made that fans of modern games love renting too, with digital purchases <laughs> <laughs> I'll be patting myself on the back all weekend for that one. So with that, leave a comment down below and I will see ya in the next video. He's the Red Cooper, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games. He's